Okay. Can we get in the Word of God today? Can we, can we be about the most important thing in our life, and that's listening to God and humbling ourselves and sitting at His feet? I know Martha wants to run around in the kitchen. I know Martha, Martha wants to run around in the kitchen and be busy about many things. And Jesus, do you care? My sister has left me to do the noodles myself. And Jesus said, she's chosen the thing. It won't be taken from her. Let's be her. Let's just let the noodles burn. Amen. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking like sideways so you can hear it go by your head. Right in your head. Oh, okay. Sorry, it's a movie. You get I'm just house. You house. And you're going to get your license. You get my license. And you're going to be a driver. Get a you already got a car. Yeah, We've never you're seen you as a driver in all, all the years I've known you. I You've know. been chauffeured your whole life like a little. <laughs> <laughs> it's been nice. Like a fancy person. I'm, I'm a little bougie. <laughs> well, that's, that's awesome that that's so, that's so big and new in your life. And God, res- and God rescued you in that, in your money situation and houses and stuff like that, and it all worked out for your good. Is that correct? No worries inside. Is that? It, it, would you give that hope to someone else? No. That comfort? No, 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 no. God said the comfort you've been comforted with. Would you comfort other people, knowing if they start, oh my goodness, we're losing everything, but like, and no, that didn't. No, God will just make the way. Yay. Whoa, now. Take care of it. There's, a little, there's, a, there's a little fight going on here. <laughs> You're going to take this hope. Take, it. take this pill. <laughs> okay, okay. All right, then. So I had a healing a few weeks back that uh, I was wanting some answers about. I have been dealing with, you know, after I listened to myself on the uh, recording, I realized I said something kind of confusing. I said I'd been dealing with it a little over a year, or maybe two years. But then somehow I flipped it back to 10 years ago when I got here. I was standing at a, um, feeding my daughter at the high chair. I did have, that was the first moment that it just grabbed me. But eventually that went away and it stayed gone for a long time. But then it, you could feel something. Then it really started acting up two years ago. A couple weeks ago, I'm sitting in my office, which is nothing more than one of them little buildings you can buy. Um, and I'm just sitting there, and I could feel the little twinge in my back coming. And so all I did was, I did the same thing I've been doing for two years, which was I would talk to my back about the healing of Jesus, and I was really even not even trying. I was just sitting there doing something different and then my back started hurting so I just stopped for a second and I was like you know back you're not going to be this way Jesus healed you. I can't have you hurting uh, me my whole life. I've got to be free. I've got to serve God. I've got to be a preacher until I'm 93 years old like the guy before me and so I, I've got to have a healed back and then all of a sudden bam I, my back was hit and I had this weird emotion like what just happened like I did this before. I even did it with snot coming out of my nose and like mad and fighting. And in this moment, I didn't do any of that. I mean, not that that, I don't know. So I I was more wanting to know what happened because I want to figure out how to give that to you and, and how to explain that. And the thing we were learning at the time was what is saving faith? You can take all this stuff in the Bible, like a Mormon and a and a a Jehovah Witness, and they'll pull Jesus out, and they'll pull the cross stake out, and they'll pull different things out, and they stack their things together, but that's not saving faith. That's different parts of faith. But just like Cain, who walked up to the altar to offer his faith, God had no respect for his faith, but when Abel comes over to his altar, maybe it was the same altar, and puts his faith on the altar, 
wham, from heaven comes lightning down. So I wanted to know, what is the exact stacking of the faith that you have to have to make the lightning versus the person over here who's putting his good works and his own righteousness and just, you know, and so I'm just like, I don't even understand. I didn't restack any different faith. I didn't, I don't even, you know, so I'm just going to be quiet. Well, I feel like this week is when God decided he was going to speak on the subject because I believe God has revealed something for all of us, especially those who are between a now and a then. Now and then. There's a, there's a space, a, a time between a now and a then. See, there's the now when I get saved versus then when I get to escape out of this place. People say, oh, he's an escapist. Jesus said, pray that you might be able to escape. Paul said, we're going to get out of here. That's an escape between now and then. There's a time and a space. Well, sometimes there's a time in your life when you have a space between now and your healing. Now and your deliverance. Now and the solution to your problem. Y'all want to hear this? This might be the most crucial thing you might need to hear. Anybody who's between a now and then, let me see your hand. Man, that's all of us. No wonder God would speak. So I'm going to tell you what he told me. For those who are between a now and then, this might be the most crucial information to connecting the two and not losing it in between the now and then. Because there was a now when I had my back hurt. And then there was a then when I actually was healed. But there was a whole lot of space in between that. And I want to talk to you about that space today. Addressing. What happens when a healing or a deliverance or a solution doesn't come quickly? Now I'm telling you what, I'm already geeked up off the world. Man, I grew up on fast food windows. I grew up on a snack machine. I could stick a 50 cent in there and and get a coat. I, I, I don't even have to make my own food. I mean, I'm just like, just, just <laughs> strung out on immediacy. Just immediate. Anything I want, I just can quench it like this. Bam, 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 bam. But sometimes I just wanted to come in here and just everything is about, wham, I'm going to lay hands on you, pow, I'm going to catch that demon, I said, pow, I'm going to give you the answer, so pow. Well, sometimes you lay hands on somebody, And there's a space in between. Sometimes you find a promise in the Bible that you see belongs to you. And then you go after it. And then it doesn't come immediately. And I need to learn this. I need to understand this part of Christianity. It, it, this, this just living by faith. Can't just be all this fast food out there in the world. I can't just come to the Bible and expect a fast food window every time I'm hungry. God, if I even ate all that stuff all the time, I'd be dead. Sometimes you need to prepare a meal and cook it and spend some time. I don't know. Here, you just listen to the word and let's see where you go with it. Daniel was between them now and then. Remember Daniel asked, praying up to God and, and, and God sending the answer immediately, but it was held up in the spiritual realm. And then whenever it came down, they found Daniel in the bar drinking. He was drunk as a skunk because he done gave up on the promise of God. He already prayed, but it never came. So he went back to his vomit. He's sitting at the bar drinking. And then all of a sudden the angel just tested him and said, Hey, I'm here. Whoops. You don't want to be found doing that mess. You want to be found like Daniel was found. He was still in faith. He was still waiting between the now and then. That's really the secret now. Is you can't be moved away between the now and then. Sometimes people will hear a healing or a deliverance or a solution or a promise in the Bible and they'll go all in for it. They see it. Whoa, preacher just preach this sermon and I'm going to go for that with all I got and then maybe they're just all programmed by the fast foodness of life and, and, and when it don't come immediately then they, they kind of just well I've already been prayed for I've already had hands laid on me I've already believed that promise I've already confessed it 
thousand times. It's very, it's very dangerous in that moment because hopelessness will come and try to set in. And disappointment. Sometimes it'll cause you to back up. You don't get mad at God, but you do get mad at the process. In this in-between time that needs uh, to be first revealed to you, you need to know that there is a, a, a process in the Bible of an in-between time. Like God has given us his promises. And he said, my word won't return to me void. And we use these promises, and if, we, if we're all believing that it's so fast food, then we don't really understand that there's a time to, 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 uh, to in between the two. There's a space that we need to learn how to navigate this space so when the answer does come and it does show up, it doesn't find us not in faith. The Bible has a thing called seed time harvest. It's funny how the seed is visible. I can see the seed. I see the problems. Here's the problems. Look, it, it, it's copied and pasted on my refrigerator. I got the Bible copied and pasted on my refrigerator. All the healing scriptures. I can see that. And then, and then, and then the harvest is visible. But the time in between is not. It's invisible. It's when it's in the ground and it's beginning to grow. There's an invisible. You can just stand there and look at the ground and be like, Psh, where am I? I know the seed's in there, but... But ain't nothing happening, so we'll dig that seed back up and just look and make sure, you know, put it back and tearing up the seed. You know, there's a, there's a time of invisibility. This time or this space between now and then, the Bible calls standing. Come on. You got to hear this. All of us who raised our hands, who's in between a now and then, God needs to find you standing in this space of time between the two. We must be taught how to bridge the space between knowing um, how to, this space between now and then, we got to know how to stand because this is what God wants, this is what he showed me about what I did. So if, we, if I stood up here and preached this sermon to you, it might be really spiritual. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I hear that. But I really don't know how to put feet on that. I don't know how to go home and do what you just said. But I agree with everything you said. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, standing, standing. Wait, what's that song? <laughs> standing on the promises of God our Savior. That's so old, I don't remember. Standing, standing. Oh, standing on the promises of God. So our standing order is a military command. It's likened to a military soldier. See, some people think they come to Christianity and they're joining the Peace Corps. Oh, we're going to just go down to Africa and feed these homeless people and pass out cups of cold water and we're just going to just never pick a fight with anything in our life and everything that happens to us is God's will. Well, God gave me this big cancer hanging off the side of my face to humble me. <laughs> we, did, we did not join. We did not join the Peace Corps. We joined the military. Yep. Right? We joined the military. There ain't no Peace Corps hippies. I mean, we're, they're out there. I get it. I, the, you know, the main doctrine people fight me with is this love doctrine. Well, we just love people. I don't know why I clicked on Facebook, but the very first post somebody's up there talking about, if you use the Bible to hate people, then you miss the point. And if you just love people who love you, you miss the point. Jesus forgave the people who were nailing him to the cross. Uh, but see, I already know this person and where they're coming from. They want to they wanna use the Bible to go woke. <laughs> hey, Mr. Transgender, I'm your friend. I love you. And all you Christians out there who are trying to speak the truth, well, you just got to love these people. The world needs to see we love them. Sorry. Sorry. So I had to put on there, did Jesus love the Pharisee? Uh-oh. Because he called them names. Like you whitewashed tombs with dead man's bones inside, you child of yep. the devil. You're going to hell because you don't believe me. 
And I'm thinking, that's an odd pattern to follow, you know? What if we, what if we could all agree on a Pharisee? And we all just walked in there and just started calling them the same names Jesus did. I said, I don't believe the Pharisees needed to feel loved by Jesus in order to be persuaded. I think they needed the ministry of truth. Because love sets how many things free? Zippity-o, zippity-do-da, zippity-o, zero. You can love something until it pokes you in the face and runs all over you and steals everything you got and kick you in the face because love sets nothing free. It's the truth that sets things free and we speak the truth in love. I didn't go back to check what they said. Watch this. So, the fight that you're in is addressed in Ephesians 6 or, or what the Lord is showing us 613 where it says this wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand I would like you to notice that you have to take armor I don't think the Peace Corps is wearing any armor they're down there with their just peace and love And sometimes they get kidnapped and beheaded. I remember those two stupid missionaries. Can I say that? I retract that. I don't know if I can say that. There was these two people. They wanted to prove the world uh, that, that this Islamic nation in uh, Iran or whatever. That they're not dangerous. They're people like us. We just got to love them. And they got on a bike and they started going across the whole, the whole whatever province. And they were never seen again. And come to find out that they murdered them gruesomely for zero reason. I don't think that worked out for them, but uh, they didn't have any armor on, I can tell you that, because they went out there with their love. Let's don't put the cart before the horse. There is love in the Bible, and it's a powerful, powerful, powerful tool of God. Anyway, you have an enemy. That's what I see in this. When, when God says you're going to have to wear armor, then that means all of a sudden I have a need to wear armor. The second thing I see is that he fights against you. And he's really trying to rob every harvest from all these seeds. The enemy wants to rob all the harvest. There's so many seeds in here for you to plant into your life and to reap that the enemy is out to steal it. The third thing is that God has clothed you with fighting clothes. See, that's why some of us have to change our mind about Christianity because sometimes it's not a Peace Corps activity. It's not just going out handing out cups of cold water, even though that is it. You need to be handing out cups of cold water with your armor on if you're handing out cups of cold water. You need to be living the Christian life every day you go to work. Every day if you're retired or you stay home, then you still wear your armor every day because we have an enemy out there to fight every promise of God from coming to pass in your life. So God said, here, let me dress you up, boy. Get in here and what's that? Let me fit you, your size. Let me dress you up. The first key is not to choose your armor. You know, we can go to some of these denominational churches, and I'm not mad at them. Denomination means you've been built a fence around yourself. I guess. And some denominations, they just pick and choose which part of the armor that they want. And a lot of them just pick the helmet of salvation, and they just focus on that. And they never even think about some of the other things. So the first key I see here, it says, take the whole armor of God. That, that, that's really important that we, that we understand that there's got to be the whole armor of God because what, what I can show you at the end is how I was attacked by every part that I needed this armor from. And if I just picked and choose which one I wanted, then he would have got me somewhere I wasn't covered. So the whole armor, it's the whole armor of God that withstands in the evil day. It's the whole, ar- it's the whole armor that withstands. It's not just some armor. Can you imagine somebody walking around in their underwear just with a big shield? <laughs> well, think, I'm fine, man. All I need is a shield. As long as I got this shield, man, I can do anything I want. Just walking around with this shield. Just almost naked, you know, just like vulnerable. 
Yeah, you get in a fight with that. See how that works. That's not what's going to withstand on the evil day. I don't care if you just had a sword and a shield. That still ain't going to work. It's the whole armor of God. But then again, I'm still telling you, I can preach this where it be so spiritual that you can amen me and not even understand how to apply it to your life. But God gave me a situation that happened in my life and then he pointed me to this scripture to say, you were confused, but here's how it happened. So we actually put feet on it today. So what I see here, there's two guarantees in this first scripture. There's a promise here that there will be an attack. Oh my goodness, what a horrible thing. Okay, uh, sending my daughter off. You know, you go in there. Now, you get ready. There's going to be bullies, and they're going to try to steal your lunch money, and they're going to try to fight you and push you in your locker. <laughs> well, I don't know if I want to go to school anymore, Daddy. Yeah, but here, let me put this on you right here. It's an electrical suit. As soon as they touch you, they're going to zap themselves down to the floor. And they're going to pee on themselves because the electricity is so charged. Oh, Okay then, Daddy, I'll just walk on through here. Not scared of the enemy. I don't know. There's a promise here that there will be an attack in an evil day. But also there's a promise with it that uh, we could withstand it with the whole armor of God. So, who brings the evil? Who brings the evil day? I wonder who that is. Let's see, some of these doctrines around here make God the enemy. Well, he's the one that took my wife from me. He's the one that gave me cancer. He's the one who's teaching me a lesson. He's the one that allowed this in my life. So, therefore, I should never resist cancer. Because this is God. All you have to do is read the Old Testament. God puts plagues on you. <laughs> I ain't got time. But I want you to hear this. There will be an attack, but we do have a promise to withstand it with the whole armor of God. Isn't that beautiful? Who brings the evil? The enemy, not God. We can stand against cancer. We can stand against brokenness. We can stand against addiction. We can stand against the things in our life that are causing us poison and not blame God. And we can withstand it. So here, between now and then, the enemy comes to get you off track. I want you to know that as these promises get preached to you, as you go to the Word and find the promises yourself, as you've had people lay hands on you and pray for you and prophesy to you, the enemy is coming in because he needs to cancel your harvest. He doesn't want to see these seeds produce anything in your life. And because some seeds take time, we always give up in the middle sometimes. We give in to the devil. We don't want him to come and take us off track between now and then. I'm trying to go a straight line to there. I want to go a straight line from there. I don't want to go there and go all which way like this trying to get there. And I kind of did. I'll tell you in a minute. Let me tell you how the devil gets you off track. You start with the seed and the promise and the, and the stuff that you saw that, that, God, that you believed God for. But the enemy comes along just to, as you're on track now with your promise. The enemy wants to come along and say, uh, now, you know God gave you that. I ain't agreeing with that. Well, I mean, you, you know that you deserve that. I ain't agreeing with that either. He's trying to get me to agree with him. That's how you get him off track. Remember Eve? He went to Eve. And Eve was standing there. And he tried to get her to agree with him so that she would get off track. And she did. Somehow all you got to do is start agreeing with the enemy. That's how he gets you off track. Just to, oh, you know that situation ain't never going to work out for you. I mean, it has been 10 years. Look what he just did. Oh, he got you thinking. Come over here to hopelessness. Come over here to doubt. Come on over here a little bit to unbelief so I can just move you just a little bit. That's the only thing that gets you off track. 
Jesus said, if you had faith this big right here, you could throw a mountain in the ocean. It's your unbelief that causes you not to be able to do it. They wanted to know, Lord, why couldn't we cast the demon out of the little boy? He said, if you had faith this big, you could have done it. It's your unbelief that's the problem. You got to get that out of there. So if the enemy can come along and you got this much faith following that promise, all he's got to do is just come and just, hey, hey, did God really say, I mean, you, you ain't really going to die. You, you would be like him. Oh, look what happened. She's just sliding off the way. What about Jesus in the wilderness? Here comes the enemy trying to do what? To get him to agree with him. But what did Jesus do? He had a Bible on his hand and he slapped him with the Bible. <laughs> but it is written. I've, these seeds in my life, son, you ain't coming to get me off track. This is my focus. The Word of God said, you ain't going to tempt the Lord your God. The Word of God said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. What? He slapped him back. I ain't getting off track. You ain't moving me from my assignment. I refuse to move because you can stay between the now and then. He had a now and then. And he never broke rank. He never went off to the side. He never agreed with the enemy. He didn't even agree with Peter when Peter was trying to tell him, Lord, don't even go there. Don't even do that. Get behind me, Satan. I ain't going to agree with that either. Sometimes we take counsel from the ungodly because they on Facebook. Well, my cousin over here, my aunt, she's so spiritual that uh, she's telling me that them tongues is the devil. We need to watch out who's trying to give us advice in our life. Make sure we're not agreeing with the ungodly. Because uh, if, if the enemy can even use Peter in that moment to, to try to convince Jesus to agree. <clears throat> All the devil's attacks is trying to get you to agree with him. Here's what happens when you agree with the enemy. He takes that place. All you got to do, he's just got to come along and he sees you striving for this promise that you believe in and he comes along. He just needs to get you to agree just a little bit that it ain't going to work. Just a little bit so that all doubt does. Here's what doubt does. It backs you up. It pulls you back. Unbelief. That's what it does. And God said, I take no pleasure in the love. Oh, back up. Unto perdition. Those who pull back. Jesus said, full speed ahead, and the enemy's going to come at you, and he's going to try to use agreement, but you ain't going to agree with him. You're going to keep on going because that seed that you're after is, gonna, is invisible during the time period, but one day it's going to sprout because God said that's what his word does. And if you don't live that way, if you're all double-minded and unstable in all your ways, then don't expect none of this to work for you. I can't believe he said that. Well, I didn't. It's in here. Anyway, so um, don't agree with the devil because then that's when you give him place. So let's say you're believing for something and he comes along and gets you to believe just a little bit. And then you, you go, you know what? I mean, it is taking a while. Bam, he's going to sit in that spot that you just agreed with him and he's just going to feed that to you. you. Feed that lie and feed that lie until he empowers that lie. And you know, it ain't going to work, so we might as well go to the liquor store. Yeah, I guess so. Now we drink. You know, you already drink. You might as well go get some dope. Man, you're so far out the door now. All that have you back it up, it was the little agreement that you took in the first place when you should have just stood and withstood. I'm going to make this uh, into legs in a minute. When I was believing for my healing in my back, then I'm sorry, y'all. I, I don't do that at home with my wife when I'm talking to her. There's something about preaching the word of God that the spirit is just talking. 
And, and I know they say, well, you need an interpreter, but I'm not talking to you like that. I'm not trying to teach you anything with tongues. He who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God. Paul said, forbid not to speak in tongues, for I speak in tongues more than y'all. But I would rather teach people with words they can understand. And if you're going to try to teach people with tongues and expect them to get anything, you need an interpreter. But sometimes when I'm holding them bowls up or sometimes when I'm, I think I'm talking to God. I'm not talking to y'all. I don't need y'all to police me. Camera. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the camera. Watch this. When I was believing for my healing in my back, the enemy came at me. When it first started, you know what I did? I did exactly what I told y'all to do. I just began to, I'd come over here by myself snotting, yelling, my back's going to be healed, and laying hands on my back, telling my son, pray for me, pray on my back, Zach. Come over here and pray for me. He'd pray for me. He'd, sometimes he'd just come in the room, Dad, I want to pray for your back. And he'd pray for my back. Because we just believe, we're just practicing, executing the Bible. Everything we believe. I'm telling him about the stripes. I never asked God to heal me. I knew he already healed me. So I'm trying to apply this healing in my body. And I'm going after and going after and going after. And all of a sudden the devil just shows up. Hey, I see you going after that. Would you believe that maybe God allowed that to happen to you? Uh, no, I will not. Oh. Well, would you believe that this is going to be permanent? He's trying to get me to imagine, what if I have to live the rest of my life this way? Wait, no, I ain't believing that either. He's trying to get me off track. I know what I'm going after. He wanted to know if I would believe that God gave it to me. I said no. Or if it was going to be permanent. I said no. But then he said, but your dad had those problems. So it's generational. And I went, ooh. Wait a minute. No. <laughs> no that's tricky. So I'll tell you what ended up happening. Is I'm going after it and I'm going after it. And all these little attacks trying to get me to agree to move off away from my faith and uh, I felt like the Lord, the guy that used to pastor this church, no, see, the guy who started this church, went and started a bunch of churches. And he left a guy here one time who was a chiropractor, and he's in town. And I, and for some reason I had this thought, you know, I'm, I'm not Dr. Hungry, I'm not mad at anybody, you need, y'all keep going to the doctor. But I thought, you know what, I might, just go to the chiropractor. <laughs> just because I, here's what I told Brittany. I kept saying, Brittany, I just feel like I just need somebody to pop me. You know, like I want to be popped, and I feel like if I just got popped or something. So it's already starting right there. So I get there, and like I'm asking him a thousand questions. How did I get like this? How do you get like? How do you hurt your back? What did I do? There's an injury. He goes, Oh man, it's just life and bad posture. I was like, Oh, I'm driving home. Life and bad posture. I just took the bait. Because the doctor told me so. He's got a bunch of weird letters behind his name. He must know what he's talking about. And, I'm, and I started thinking, man, I do have bad posture. Just ride in the car like this for hours. Sit down like that, you know. I didn't have like an old mama like that to make you sit up, boy. She was a dancer, boy. She would make you sit straight. I wish she would, anyway. Nobody did that to me. I was a sloucher. I mean, I just was like, man, that makes perfect sense. And maybe I had to go around one more time. After the chiropractor told me that, I almost agreed to take it uh, permanently. But there came a day when he didn't do anything to help me. And I started going, I took my faith out of that guy. I took it back. And I stopped going there and I said, give me my money back. And he had to write me a check. And I went back to what I was believing in. Even if a smoker was told that their lung cancer came from 20 years of smoking and you agree with that, you just lost. Yeah, but, 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 but it's true. What 
What is true? What is true? Which one's true? Pilate looking at Jesus and said, what is true? You know what Jesus did? He did this. I'm just kidding. I mean, I don't know if he smiled, but I think he was ready for a selfie. <laughs> because he's like, partner, you looking at it. He didn't even answer him. He could have told him, it's me. Everything I'm saying is true. I am the truth. Pilate said, what is truth? Didn't answer him a word. Because you're looking at him, partner. Yeah, 20 years of smoking. I get it. All the facts. But the truth says that I'm not to believe any of that mess. That I'm going after what's more true than that is that by his stripes, I am healed. That's my truth. I don't care what you say, doctor. I, I read it and I saw it and I paid you a lot of money for your x-ray and your advice that you learned in your big expensive school. But... Maybe I don't know if you can do that or not. I wish I would have done it faster. Watch this. No matter what, you must resist with the word of God, the truth, because that's how Jesus resisted. I don't even think the devil lied to him. You know, if we took you up to this pinnacle right here and threw you down, everyone would believe in you. You could skip all this uh, other stuff. That might be true. If you take Jesus up onto the, uh, whatever the new tower they build in place of the two towers and just let him jump off, backflip, pipe, dive to the band and land on his head and get up, and people were like, what? Jesus said, nope, that's not true. That's my truth. We got to resist like Jesus. Look at Ephesians 13 again. It says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may, may be able to withstand. Withstand means to stand against something. There's your first stand. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, the next verse says, Stand, devil. That's three stands. That's a lot of stands. Withstand, having done all to stand, stand therefore. Here's the major revelation. Here's the major re revelation. Here's a major revelation. If you're writing something down, please write this down. There is no waiting. I don't see no waiting. Stand, stand, withstand. You know, there's Christians in the hospital bed right now waiting on God to heal them. And then I'll get a call. They died. But I was waiting on God. Oh, you're waiting on God. Hmm. It's right here in the Old Testament. You wait on God. Waiting on the Lord. It's, I looked it up. It's, it's, it's scattered throughout the Old Testament. Waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord. In fact, they have one in James. James 5, 7. Here's a different waiting. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband waits for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he receives the early and latter rain. That's waiting. That, that's a form of waiting. But that's not this standing. Standing is a totally different thing. Standing, having done all to stand. People are waiting on God all day and they die with the thing they're waiting on. Don't wait. Stand. Having the finished work of Jesus means we don't wait, we stand. Man, they waited on the Lord, waiting on the Lord, waiting on the Lord. Then what happens? Oh, my. there's God in the flesh. Oh, we were waiting on that. And then he takes it to the cross and he says, it is finished. And then he tells me, go ye therefore. And don't wait on me anymore. You go and you stand in the finished work. And you partake of the divine nature. I've given you all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Don't wait on me anymore. Stand. 
The enemy's going to come and try to take it away from you. That's what's going on now if you want to rightly divide the Bible up. It's standing. The enemy comes to steal it away from you and destroy it and abort it. He's the first abortionist doctor. He wants to abort everything in your life you're believing for. Every little hope you got, he wants to abort it and destroy it. He wants to steal it. That's why he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Notice that you can't stand first until you've done how much stuff? All. Did we get 14? Can I go back to 14? I'm going to read it here. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about. Well, I mean, 13, I'm sorry. And having done all to stand. Now, in this context, having done all really means to take all the armor of God. Having done all in this context. So let's read what it says in verse 14. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. I don't know if I can leave the rated G to explain to you what loins are. You know what I'm talking about? So you got to gird them things up. You got to gird your parts up. It's a belt-ish thing. It's a utility belt is the way I think about it. Like it's the girdle, the belt of truth. The reason you got to put that on first is because all your stuff hooks to the belt. It's so important that the Bible says, having your loins girt about with truth. Oh my goodness, here's how we're going to get to start. So when the enemy comes along to do what? Move you with agreement with whatever he's saying to you, trying to get you to, hey, look, man, look, they done sent you this message that they ain't never coming home. Oh, I see it. But I ain't agreeing with you because I'm holding on to this promise right here until I see it all the way through. Because that's what I'm supposed to do. And you're not going to get me off track. So, <laughs> you got to take the belt. You got to gird yourself with truth. It's not relative truth. I keep seeing this on uh, some of these news things I look at. People go, truth is relevant, facts matter. Isn't that cute? Truth is relevant. That means everybody has their own truth. But facts matter. No, 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 no. 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 That other stuff ain't truth. This is the only truth. The truth is not relevant. It's not relevant. It's not, oh, well, he has his truth and he has and she has and they have and whatever gender they are and whatever is not each person's truth. It's the truth. There's one truth. Quit saying that there. It's almost like taking God saying this is truth. This is what sets you free. And now everybody just has truth. But facts matter. No, 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 no. Facts don't matter. I don't care about the x-ray. I don't care about the blood work. I don't care that my child's smoking a crack pipe. I don't care about those facts. The truth says. I don't know. I'm going to get me stirred. Here, let me get back. Getting close. I'm getting close. Y'all made it. Y'all making it. I'm going to put some more feet on it. Okay, so first thing we do taking the whole armor of God is the enemy is going to attack you. And you can withstand the attack by taking the first piece and putting on and girding yourself up with the truth. Because that's what he's going to try to come and move you from. No, the truth is. No, see, the truth is. No, no, that's what Jesus said. No, the truth is. No, 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 no. The truth is. Hey, uh, I'm going to repeat what Jesus did. The enemy like, bah, bah, bah. no, the truth is. No, the truth is. No, the truth is. Because see, what that does keeps you right on the path, going straight down. The truth is. It's not good ideas. It's not undivided scripture. Well, my favorite verses is found back here in Ecclesiastes. Song of Solomon. <laughs> I'm fine with that. Those are shadows of the real thing. Imagine God coming in the room and we want to hug and kiss his shadow. <laughs> no way, dude. If I saw somebody down there trying to talk to my shadow, I'd be like, what are you doing? Over here. <laughs> here I go. All right, anyway. You 
You know, I enjoyed ministering to somebody this week. Man, I had a cool revelation this week. I had somebody come and sit down with me because I just I, I was telling them, you know, let let me. There's this ministry that I God gave me to cleanse out people and work through things in their life. So I'm sitting there and I'm writing down all these because you know we go through all the crazy things that happen in your life. You know, da 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 da. Yeah, oh, yeah. Your dad did that, and the neighbor kid and did that to you, and you were beat by your husband and. Uh, and then bam, bam. I got to the end, I was like, you know, you should be suffering from this. But I'm not. Really? How come? Because I'm so hungry for the word of God that I would just be reading the Bible and God would just show me something and reveal it to me. And then all of a sudden it would just like heal me and deliver me. And I went, oh. That's cool, because usually I have to cast, I have to pray and cast certain things out and, and cleanse and, you know, heal these wounded parts. And, you know, just because the enemy will live in stuff that never, that you don't ever expose to God and let him heal. Some people just want to be Christians and move on past all the broken stuff in their life. And sometimes that works, but sometimes you need to, I don't know. But the, she said the word of God did it. So I said, well, you should be suffering from this. But I'm not. But really? You're not? Huh? How come? Well, because I say you should I say you should have problems giving and receiving love. Well, I don't. I said, why not? She said, I used to. But then God showed me in the word this. Bam 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 bam. My whole body changed. And I, I can. And I give love and receive love. And I, Whoa. This is fun. <laughs> Normally I sit down with people and it's be diagnosed with things and I can see what I have to. Well, you should have trust issues with men. Well, I don't. Why not? Because I did, and God showed it. And I was like, you know what's going on here? The Word has the same power as deliverance. The Word has the same power as healing. See, I meet a lot of people, they're not into the Word, and they just sit down with their problems, and I can just say, oh, well, you probably have some of this connected to that, right? Yes, and then we pray about it, and then that's their remedy. But this person had the remedy already given to them through the Word of God. They were able to get healing and deliverance and receive the gospel through this. I was like, this is so enjoyable listening to this, how the word of God gave you that. Now, we found maybe one or two things, you know, and I don't, and God, I believe she, she could have had all that from the word. Anyway, I don't know, okay. So I was excited this week as I got to minister to somebody to witness the freedom power of the word. It's comparable to deliverance. The word can do what deliverance does. So my son's calling me from college, and man, they're all into healing. They're big, nationally, internationally known healing people. And he goes, Dad, they throw digs at deliverance. I said, really? He said, yeah, but they believe in healing, and they lay hands. But they throw digs at deliverance. And I said, well, you can't throw that out. You've got to have all of it. He goes, well, what they say is, is that the reason a person is in bondage is because they don't know the word well enough. So therefore, if anybody needs that, we just tell them you need to know more about the word. See how that's true and not true. I meet people that the word hasn't done that to them and they need me to do the ministry of that. Jesus said, go lay hands on sick, cast out devils, speak in other tongues and, 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 and take the gospel. So, so some people need that. But then I learned that the word also give that to them. If you get hungry with the word, the word can lead you into all, all that. So anyway, I guess it, you can say all day that the problem with deliverance, the, the deliverance haters out there say it's just the word. That's all they need to be delivered. But we got to lay hands on you to be healed. I'm like, wait a minute. How come you don't use that for everything then? Anyway, okay, I'm back to this. I'm boring y'all with my son again. Watch this. All right. So... You know, all that practicing comes from the word. All right. I can see here's the rundown to the scriptures and the conclusion. The attack is withstood by taking the truth. So here it comes. When the enemy comes to attack, there's a promise that there's attack. There's a promise that you can withstand it. The first thing that you have to have is truth. You've got to be walking around and just saying truth, just speaking truth, believing truth, just like Jesus did. Resist every doubt, every fear, everything that's getting you away from the promise that you're you're going after or you're seeking. You've got to walk around with the truth. Just know the truth, even if it's just one thing. If all you 
I can say is God, well, God's for me. That's good. I mean, I don't care what it is. Just, just you got to have that to withstand the fighting or the attacks. You, you, you got to be girded up with the truth like Jesus was girded up. Now, the next piece is your breastplate. Look at verse 13. It says, um, no, 14. Uh, you're girded with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Well, this is interesting because this is the next thing. It's righteousness, but whose is it? It's got to be Jesus. I was, you know, I teach the kids before I come in here, so I dumb, this, I dumb every message down to their level. And I said, kids, and I'm saying righteousness, and I just see blank stares. You know, I'm telling about the breastplate of righteousness. I said, here's how you can think about righteousness. Everything Jesus did right to please God, you're wearing it. So therefore, the enemy can't come along and condemn me. Oh, see, that's what another attack. See, that's a different attack. That's a total different attack when he comes along and he goes, man, you sucked this week. Like, you just need to stop. God ain't going to honor nothing you're doing. You just totally went back and drank something out of that bottle, and you, you just condemned, and you're, look at your filthy rag righteousness. I'm, like, I'm not wearing my righteousness. This is his righteousness. He gave this to me. I seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness. It's his righteousness that makes me not have to go off when the enemy tries to get me to do religion. When you're wearing his righteousness, the enemy, see, the enemy can't come along and move you with condemnation. Because it's not your righteousness that pleases God. It's Jesus' righteousness. And it's not uh, any religion or your works anymore. Well, if you really wanted to come home, if you really want to do that, then you're going to have to step up your game and ba 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 You're trying to trick me right there. See, I have his righteousness and my faith is not going to be moved while I'm wearing this breastplate. Attack me all you want. A soldier, see. And let's go to the next one. We're almost done. And your feet, shod. That means, that word in the Greek, means to bind it under your foot. To bind it under your foot like a sandal or a shoe. Your feet now. Can you imagine a soldier? We, we dress them all up. Hey, we got a soldier over here. What if we sent... Him out onto the battlefield. I mean, he's fully geared out, but he's barefooted. All you got to do is break some glass and throw it on the ground, and you ain't going nowhere. <laughs> but it's not just any shotting or binding of your feet. It's through the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, here's how important that is. It says... Uh, that well, first a soldier is no good without proper footwear. So the next piece is your shoes, because the enemy's gonna try to trip you, or poke you in the bottom of your foot, or keep you from able to travel down the road. He's gonna try to stop you in some way, some kind of attack. He'll try to lead you down a different path of anxiousness. He'll put obstacles in your way. He'll take. He'll try to steal your peace. That comes to you from the gospel. So really, if you got if you got into the gospel and you begin to put it, bind it to your feet, where you walk around, where I get to just walk in every place by peace. See, now the enemy comes along and goes, "Hey, hey, man, you that job stressing you out? These people stressing you out? I mean, all, all this." You're like, "Man, I'm walking in this gospel of peace." See, all these different attacks came at me. And I would just continue, right, to fight off all the attacks and just stay in a place. So when the time came, all of a sudden, I wasn't even really doing anything except just standing there just like using my armor. You know, yeah, this is my training. It was all it was just like bam, bam, wax on, wax off. Bam, bam. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> you need the gospel of peace under your feet to keep you from exhaustion. To keep you from failing. To keep you from pulling your hair out. From being anxious. Look at Romans 10, 15. I see this gospel of peace. Where it says how beautiful are those who, who um, uh, carry the gospel of peace. Is that what it says? It says how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. And bring good tidings. See, but it's not about you just bringing that. It's about you walking in it. See, you've got to practice what you preach. That's standing. It's not just out there just just giving out the gospel of peace. It's you walking in it. 
in such a way that when the enemy comes to attack you in such a way, you're walking in the gospel of peace. And I got truth. And I got a breastplate of righteousness. So he's trying to attack me all which way, just trying to get me to agree with him about anything. It's like, oh, well, you're, you're stuck and you're condemned. No, no, I got the righteousness of God. And, and, and the Bible says that's why the Holy Spirit was given to me, so that that righteousness, I could be made that righteousness. I could be made that righteousness. The Holy Spirit makes you holy. You got to let him. You got to get in that process of his fruit coming out of your body. All right, let's work our way on down through this stuff. Above all is the next 16. Above all. It doesn't say last of all. Above all. In this context, standing with the armor, the shield of faith is above all. Isn't that weird? I, I can't explain it to you. I just let the Bible. Above all, taking the shield of faith Wherewith you shall be able to quench a couple, a few, almost all, 99.99%. Man, that little bitty word means such a big thing. All the fiery darts of the enemy you can withstand. You shall be able. Be able means, you know how they march down the road in their military? What they call them, the blues, and the dress up. What's your dress up gear called? Yes, that ain't what we're talking about. <laughs> People want to walk around with a big shiny hand, man, marching in a parade, a little military parade. Ooh, look at me. Look at my shield. Look at my sword. You pull it out, it's brand new. Ain't never got no marks on it or nothing because they're just marching along like decoration. No, no, no. <laughs> you shall be if you use it, not as decoration. This is when the shield comes in. You shall means not in a military parade, but actually when you begin to use this in an attack, the fiery darts can come. Watch this. Oh, man. When they used to hold them, them shields, you just think, boop, 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 boop. No, no. A fiery dart would come and knock the soldier down. You would hold that shield and, and you would get shot with an arrow. In fact, they used to have to wet the shields because they'd light the arrow on fire and shoot it at you. It would hit you so hard, boom, and knock you on the ground. That's warfare. Well, I got my little shield just walking around with my faith. When I got my shield up protecting me, my faith will not be moved. And them fiery darts will knock you down on the ground. Is how powerful that they can come. And then you have to hold up that shield of faith. It ain't no decoration. You should have some marks. You shall withstand them. Not some of them. All of them. Look at Luke 22. This is an interesting thing. These darts attack your faith. Remember when Peter told, I mean, Jesus told Peter, the devil wants you. Through your faith. But I have prayed for you, Peter, that your faith fail you not. You know what he was about to do? He was about to go from an hour and a then. It was an in-between time. And the enemy was going to come and try to get his faith to cause him. But Jesus said, I prayed that your faith fail you not. So that why? You could keep going and you'd make it. The helmet of salvation is next. Let's look at that. Verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation. And the, whoop, I don't want to get to the sword yet. When you put on this helmet, the enemy's going to come try to get you off track by your relationship with God. No, my relationship to God is through the blood of Jesus, who is eternal, offered in the heavens. And I will not be moved away from anything you're trying to get me to do because my helmet of salvation keeps every attack away. You can see that the relationship is going to be attacked. So God said, put on your knowledge. Remember those people who come down and get saved every week? Oh, the enemy's just killing them. They're smashing them because they have no knowledge of being saved. They think they're saved. Might be saved. They could have been saved. I was saved once before I committed adultery. Oh, the enemy got him. Oh, you committed adultery now. You're unsaved. <laughs> no. 
The blood of Jesus is faithful to cleanse me and wash me from all problems and sins and iniquities. Now, you ain't getting me that way. Look at 2 Timothy 1, 12 and 13. I can see the end if that helps you. 2 Timothy. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know in whom I have believed and persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him until that day. Do you understand what Paul is saying? I will never back up. I know that I know that I know in whom I trust, and he is able. So I will not be moved. I will not be moved. Even when they stoned Paul to death and drug him out of the city, some, some translators say by a horse, <laughs> drug his dead body out of the thing. He, he didn't get up and go, you know, I think I, think I missed God on that one. I would have never been stoned had I, uh, if God had a favor on me. And he, he got up and went to the next city. And continued on because he knew that he knew that he knew he knew that he knew that he knew. He even actually came back to the same city. <laughs> that dude buckwild. Anyway, okay, we're almost done. See, borders on some people's faith. So when you know in whom you trust and he's able to keep you, see, that's what that helmet of salvation. Now the enemy, he's literally trying to get to you any which way he can. And you are totally covered in the whole arm of God. I ain't believing that. Oh, you coming at me this way? Mm-mm. You coming at me this way? Mm-mm. You coming at me this way? Mm-mm. And trying to kick you between the lip. Pop. Boop. Nope. Imagine that. Oh, you trying to put stuff on the ground? That ain't going to work either. None of this going to work. And I got my shield of faith. And then I'm going to take this sword of the Spirit, which he defines for you as the Word of God. It's funny how the Word of God is here and again. It's so powerful, the Word of God. And we want to turn the gospel into love. The love is in the gospel. See how tricky that is. Man, that's the trickiest trick of them all. The devil, they say, is crafty. I know how to get these Christians off track if we could just focus on all the love and then make it emotional and realize, well, these trans people just think that we don't like them. So if we just love them, then maybe they'll listen to us. Anyway, okay, I'm going to bore you with that. Watch this. So that, this is what I learned about this helmet. I have a motorcycle. And I've always wanted to live in a state where there's no helmet law. And I don't know if God would have ever let me do that because I would have never wore a helmet, ever. But the Bible has a helmet law. You have to ride with a helmet. <laughs> or you will be a... This is what they call me, a squid. As people, they ride around with just shorts on and a tank top, no helmet, no shoes. You just ride a motorcycle. And then there's somebody that drives by, and I mean, he's geared up with a bubble wrap. <laughs> he's riding around. He's looking at me like, look at that idiot. I'm looking at you like, look at that idiot. You know? Can you even feel me there? Are you even having fun in there? Oh, that's all right. That was fun just for me. That's fun for me. But what happens is, here's my last thing about the helmet. Once you, once you get the helmet on, see the salvation, you get the mind of Christ. Now you can be a partaker of the divine nature. And all things that's been given unto you. Now I can actually come to the word of God and begin to get in here. Because my salvation gives me legal right to all these things beginning to work in my life. But the enemy, if he could come along and say, you ain't even saved. You ain't, definitely ain't trying to plant nothing. Now, sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, it's interesting that the Bible says here that the word of God, this word of God is the word rhema. But I went back and restudied this, and a lot of people think that rhema means that it's this mystical thing where God then just now makes the word do something. I don't know, weird or... But that's really not what's happening, because James said that uh, be doers of the word, but that is logos. Rhema, let me tell you what this is real quick. The sword, the word of God, here's what this means. Why, why is rhema used here rather than logos? Logos or logos, whatever they say, it, they say is the written word. And then the rhema word is the word that, you know, mystically does something. No, rhema is the word, the logos that you're doing in your life. There's so much logos in here and you ain't doing all this. 
But the words that you are doing is rhema. That's what rhema is. Rhema means the actual word of God that you execute. I like to say practice, but somebody came along and said, that sounds like a doctor practicing medicine. We ain't, no, we ain't doing that. We're executing the Bible. This rhema word just means this word of God, this sword of the spirit means the actual word that you're, you're living, you're, you're living by, you're fighting, you're quoting, got the truth, you got the breastplate, it's the stuff that you operate in because there's people out there, there's denominations that won't even operate in those parts of the logos. So they're not in, there's no rhema word in their life. All right, so here's the concluding parts. In verse 18, I've, I've, heard, this, I've heard this armor preached to me as, as, since I've been in the church. You know, and I mean almost uh, 80% of them skip this verse. They stop right there with the sword of the spirit. That is not the end. You have one more weapon. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, which is the word of God. That means your prayers, while armored up, while the enemy's trying to attack your faith because you're going after something, you just say, listen, it's going to be this way, or I'm going to die in this right here, and the enemy's trying to get you to pull off. Well, uh, I've got to begin to, uh, all, all my armor on, I also pray the word of God. That's how you take the sword of the spirit. That's because now that word is becoming rhema to you. It's now you're practicing it. Now you're praying it in the spirit. And also the spirit is praying in the spirit. Paul said when you come together, have a song, a spiritual song. Speak in tongues. Speak in the uh, understanding. It's a very powerful tool here. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Praying the word of God. Watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. I was attacked in all these areas, but I withstood them by standing. And I completed the journey of my back being healed. But I did this. And didn't know it. The enemy would come along and, and somehow I would, you know, go play with a back brace. No, I'm, I'm not telling you don't wear a back brace. I'm talking about me. And, and then I would just kind of back off of me and I'd start looking for a natural solution or something. And then, and, then, and then it would fail me and I would come back to my faith. And then I would just stay there long enough that I would, would try this thing. And it failed me and then I would just come back... What if I never did that? I would like to know would my journey have been shorter if instead of walking like this, if I never did that? I don't know. I would, Galatians 6 is my last verse. Let him that is taught... In, oh, <laughs> just for fun, sorry. Okay, just for fun. I was just throwing this in there saying... Let him who is taught in the word give money unto him that teaches him. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Y'all give me the next verse. <laughs> Just don't worry about that. <laughs> next verse. I thought it was going to be funny. Give me the next verse. <laughs> be not deceived. This is really what I came to look at. Don't forget that. But you did see where it said, if I teach you, you're supposed to give me some money. <laughs> I'm just saying, you saw that right. Nope. The word communicate here means give me some money. <laughs> I'm sorry we have guests here because I, I don't, I hate money. I don't want your money. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know why I threw it in there. Okay. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that's what he's going to reap. We just told uh, to stand requires you to be sowing to this spirit with your sword and the word of God and praying the word of God and sowing to the spirit because as you're sowing to that spirit, this is what's going to happen. See? That shall you also reap. For he that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not err. Man. man, this just gets tiring, man. Every day I wake up, the first thought in my head is the enemy throwing a fiery dart. Everything you're doing is just stupid. It's never going to work. You're not good enough. You keep making mistakes. It's really your fault. 
No. Stand up. Shut up, devil. Let me get my shoes on. Put my belt on. Breastplate. Helmet. Machine. What'd you say? <laughs> Hello? Oh, he ran. Because you resist the devil and he does what? Well, I just agree with you here. You can come sit right here and talk to me all day how it ain't going to work. I ain't giving you that place. <clears throat> don't be weary. Well, don't be weary in well doing, for in due season, if we shall reap, if. That's what happened to me. And I, I, and I did do this. But I got there. Next time, I am still between now and then. Some different things. I just want to learn how I can get straighter at this. I want to get better. I'm striving to be perfect. Jesus said, be therefore perfect as your heavenly father in heaven is perfect. That's not child abuse for God to expect us striving to be perfect. It is the defects, but not us. Is that verse 9? If. So standing will cause this. Standing will cause the thing you're believing for to harvest if we faint not. That's what happened to me. So I'm going through this journey with my back, and I didn't understand it all happened, and it was just because, well, God, Brian, you were doing all these things. The enemy would come with all these different thoughts, like generational and this, and it's your fault, and God, you know, bam, bam. No, 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 and no. And yes, you did get me to go. But then I came back. And then, uh, no. Standing. See, Jesus told a demon not to enter into him no more. Isn't that interesting? There's a promise in the Bible that even if you're an uh, 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 evil spirit will come off of something, he, he wants to come back. But we resist the devil and he flees. The enemy needs you to agree with him again so you can lose the seed before the harvest. That's really what happens. When you go into believing God for something, he's coming to rob you of that harvest just by getting you to agree with him, by telling you lies, twisting the word, using religion, using condemnation, using no peace, using all these different things, your salvation don't work, all this stuff. But if you could armor yourself up and just stay the course, how good would it be to go to heaven and say, God, I just stood the course. I did exactly what I was commanded to do was to stand, stand, stand. Jesus said, when I come back, am I going to find faith? Faith, you start making your sit way up here. Wigglesworth was an interesting man. He got a lot of cool things done. I mean, he was kicking dead babies off the stage and they brought this lady up I had a big tumor hanging out of her and standing on the side of the stage he said let her go and they went, let her go and then they let her go she fell down and hit the thing and screamed pick her up picked her up let her go okay they dropped her hit the ground she screams now everybody else is done except him pick her up and they were thinking, uh-uh, I ain't even going to pick her up. Pick her up! And he wasn't like, well, would you please pick her up? This guy, I love you so much. Would you just pick her up? Just pick her up, please. No. Pick her up! Pick her up a third time. Let her go! I can imagine him going, I ain't letting her go. Let her go! And they let her go, and the tumor fell out. Documented. This man was bucked to the wild. Lady brought a dead baby, said, lay that baby right there. Preach. The baby, the baby came alive and mom took it home alive, right? You know what he said? Every sickness is a demon. Okay, that's, no. No, that's not my point. Whether that's right or wrong, that's not what I'm trying to say. This is, this is, what, this is what you need to take from that. Every broken thing in your life needs to be treated like it's a demon or darkness, or something that's anti-God in such a way that you're not pansying around, like you're violent and you're aggressive. You're standing for the promise of God. And I'm going to stand in such a way that I look like I don't have any love right now, but I got so much love because I'm standing. And the thing that's coming against me 
is trying to kill me. So I'm not like, well, sir, can you please just not kill me? Can, sickness, would you please just go away? Sickness, will you leave me alone? Who's another guy that got written into history like Smith Wigglesworth and John G. Lake? These people, there's a lot of people, and, and, and they were so aggressive. And the church is just on Xanax. We're just like, oh, well, you know, I mean, maybe God's teaching me a lesson. This is the way it is, you know. Yeah, you know, I got cancer. I got high blood pressure. I got diabetes. I got problems. You know, I just got voices in my head. But, you know, I try to tell them to go. We're in a fight. You don't baby stuff. So I end with this. Here's what I'm learning. We got a new puppy. Supposed to, you got to teach a puppy calm, submissive energy. So I'm teaching this dog this, right? And then so my little girls, the dog sees them, runs and jumps into their lap, bites their face, eats their food. They scream at the top of their lungs. I'm like, push the dog off of you. Just right back up, boom, 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 boom. just doing all kinds of chucking their clothes around like this. You don't never do that to me. And I'm going, what is wrong with them? Can, like, I need you to get aggressive. Like, don't hurt the dog. It's not me. And now I'm like, listen, you're yelling at him out of anger. Don't do that. Like, don't even yell the devil out of anger. Like, it's just authority. So it's like I'm watching my little girls like try to deal with this puppy that just keeps. I mean, and I'm just like, I can go over there and go. show them, I just see like they don't have this, they're just like, oh, I just keep jumping on me, oh, and I push him off, and I put him on the floor, and I just, and just boo, boo, boo. Miss Wigglesworth said, treat that dog like a demon. <laughs> I know, I know. It, it just means there's authority here, like there's as a stand. Jesus wants you to take what he did. Jesus never really yelled at anything. It was just like, get out. You're going to go. They're screaming back at him. So as I'm watching this, I feel like that's the church. Like, we don't even know how to, like, come against things and stand and, and, and believe. To stand against something without the anger. Don't get emotional. You don't need any emotion. People want to live by their feeler now, but you live by your knower. But I just don't feel like, I just feel like when I yell, people don't think I love. I, I still get aggressive, you know, with things. And, and I, I get loud. I'm trying to figure out how to, do, how to keep the aggression and the authority without, you know, maybe going, go! this down because I feel like the Lord showed me this but uh, some of y'all look at me like I operate on a different level some of you think that God hears my prayers some of you think that I have gifts you don't have that's the devil lying to you you have everything that I have. You can do anything I can do. All I am is a believer. So if you, if you want to know what I got, I am a believer of the word. And you can have everything I have when you become a believer. Lord Jesus, your word said that we're going to come under an attack. Because the enemy's trying to rob us from the promises that you've given us. But if we'll learn to take your promise and stand every attack, you have equipped us to withstand every attack from the enemy. You shall be able to quench all the fiery darts and withstand in the evil day. 
So, Lord Jesus, we're trying to learn this in our life. We're trying not to be moved. We don't want to believe in the bad reports and the depression and the news and the viruses and the vaccines and all these things that make us fear. We're just going to fear not in the middle of all this stuff. So, Father, we put on all this armor so that the harvest of your promises in our life will not be slowed down because if we faint not in the space between now and then, you share. You shall receive that that you reap. God, I thank you that you just, you care enough about us that this late in the game, you're still speaking to us about all the things and goodness that you have, all your thoughts for us that are above our thoughts and all your ways that are above our ways. You're calling us into those and you won't let us be distracted or moved away, but constantly reminding us that you are good. You are good. You are so good. So we have to change our mind about you because you're better than we think. God, teach us how to be authoritative to the enemy. But just like Jesus, who was so loving, and he had all authority and all power was given unto him, that he said, for me to go ye therefore. Everybody who's between a now and then, I want you to hear the word to stand. And the enemy's going to come and attack you in all these different ways. And I want you to be able to resist him in all the different ways. And he will flee from you. And you will succeed because God's word has a promise that it will not fail. It will not fail. The only one that fails is if you faint. So now we know the enemy's coming to move us. I've seen so many people start a journey and they stop. I can go back and show you where you agreed with the enemy somewhere, some slight little thing. That's where you took the left hand turban at Albuquerque. Lord Jesus, your word is true. You are true. We trust you. We believe in you. And we're going to stand until we see that which we believe for.
I want to fix one thing. Hello? Yes. I want to fix one thing. Uh, you can go to the doctor, but here's how you go to the doctor. His report, whose report will you believe? That's what it's about. Yeah, I mean, we can use him and he can help us and we can navigate all that without agreeing in such a way that the enemy has place. There was an a old man who, uh, he was 85 or something, and, and, and he was working on a farm. And he was going, and, and, and he went, and some of his family members asked him to go take a physical, and they mailed him a letter, and the letter said, hey, you, you got some heart disease. And, and when they read that, then his old lady made him stop working, and he died six months later, but he was already working with that heart disease. It's when the report came that he he can get the report and you can look at it and you can say, wow, those facts don't matter. Facts don't matter. But the truth is, I'm going to keep working. And I'm going to keep going with God. And I'm going to keep breathing. And I'm going to keep working on this farm. And I already had that stuff before you even told me about it. So now I'm not going to just buy into it. So you can go there. I'm not telling you not to go. I'm just saying there's a... It's also designed to get you to believe and agree with that. And just no matter what you do, just always hold the line standing for what you believe in about God. Whatever the word says. Doctor, I, I see the x-ray just like you do. But I, you don't, don't tell him that. I'll put you in a straitjacket. But as you're driving home, just say, God, I, I, I heard the doctor, but I just want to agree with you more. Just so you know, just saying it out loud. And I don't care what happens. Just so you know, I'm never going to buy into anything that's down here that doesn't agree into your word. I'm not going to believe the reports. I'm not going to believe the mess. I believe what God is. I'm going to stand and I'm not going to move. All right, I'm done getting in trouble about doctors. So Father, we just dismiss in the blessing. We're going to go back out there and we're going to withstand all the attacks and we're not going to be moved. We're going to see it through to the end, whatever that end is that you're looking for. If that promise is in this Bible, he put it there for you. In Jesus' name, amen.